recall that we are attempting to prove that phi is multiplicative. In other words, for relatively prime natural numbers s and t, phi of s times t is equal to phi of s times phi of t. How did you find the formal proof of the first stage? Emmy? It was okay. It wasn't that complicated. It just took a long time to check everything. Ron? I made it to the end, but it was exhausting. I had to eat a cookie, and I had to start over three times. Well, perhaps eating the cookie helped? I ate the whole bag! From stage one, we know that we can calculate phi of s times t by counting the numbers less than s times t that are relatively prime to both s and t. In subsequent stages, we actually count the numbers that are relatively prime to both s and t, and I'm going to illustrate the process by showing how it works for specific numbers. So, who would like to pick values for s and t? 8 and 10! that are relatively prime? Oh. How about 8 and 9? 8 and 9 are certainly relatively prime. We begin by drawing a grid. This grid has 9 columns and 8 rows. We won't be needing the top left grid square, so we remove it. Then, row by row, we write successive natural numbers in the squares, like this. Ron, what's 8 times 9? Um, 8 eighths, 64, plus 8, 72? Right, so notice that each number in the table is strictly less than 8 times 9. Yeah, but they're not all relatively prime to 8 and 9. I'm sure we haven't finished yet, Ron. I mean, none of the numbers in the first column look like they're relatively prime to 9. That's because they're multiples of 9. It's clear that none of the numbers in the first column can be the numbers we're looking for, so let's just get rid of them. We can't get rid of a column with 1 at the top. I mean, 1 is relatively prime to 8 and 9, so it's one of the numbers we're looking for. But the 3 column should go. Except for 57, they're all multiples of 3, so no way they're relatively prime to 9. 57 is 3 times 19. Then they're all multiples of 3. We need to throw them away. We do. But before we can discard the 3 column, let's look more closely at the numbers in each column. In particular, I'm interested to know what happens when you divide each number in a column by 9. For example, let's take the 1 column. Emmy, what's 1 divided by 9? 0, remainder 1. Ron, what's 10 divided by 9? Um, 1, remainder 1? Emmy, what about this one? 19 divided by 9 is 2, remainder 1. Ron? Um, 3, remainder, um... The remainder's always 1, Ron. I mean, the numbers in this column are 1 more than the numbers in the first column, and they're multiples of 9, so their remainder is always 0. Remainder 1. Emmy makes a good point. What can you tell me about the remainders for the 2 column? Anything in the 2 column has a remainder of 2. Correct. Divide any number in the 2 column by 9, and you get a remainder of 2. Ron, what about the 3 column? The remainder's 3? So you can tell what the remainder will be by looking at the number at the top of the column? Exactly. Can we throw away the 3 column now? Yes.
We can also throw away the 6 column. None of those numbers are relatively prime to 9. Consider it done. Notice that the number at the top of each of the discarded columns is not relatively prime to 9. However, all the remaining columns are topped by numbers that are relatively prime to 9. That there are 6 of these should not be a surprise since phi of 9 equals 6. Also, if you take the top number and add 9, you get the next number in the column, and then the next, and so on. For example, 1 plus 9 is 10, plus 9 is 19, and so on. All the numbers in a column share the same remainder when divided by 9, and for reasons that are made plain in the proof that you'll read, all the numbers in each of these columns are relatively prime to 9. So every number shown here is relatively prime to 9. OK, now let's look at what happens when the numbers in the columns that remain are divided by 8. Ron, what's 1 divided by 8? 0 remainder 1? Very good. Since we've been focused mainly on the remainders, I'm going to replace the number by its remainder when divided by 8, like this. Please continue, Ron. 10 divided by 8 is 1 remainder 2, 2 remainder 3, 28 is, uh, well, I think Emmy should help. I can't do all the work. Do you just want the remainders? Yes, go ahead. 28 divided by 8 has a remainder of 4, 37 is remainder 5. I see a pattern! It's 6, 7, and 8. Well, we never get a remainder of 8 when we're dividing by 8, so I think you mean 6, 7, and 0. Good. Yeah, I meant to say 0. There's also a pattern for the 2 column. Go ahead. 2 divided by 8 has a remainder of 2. 11 has a remainder of 3. 20 of 4. 29 of 5. 38 of 6, 47 of 7, and 56 is a multiple of 8, so the remainder is 0. Continue. And 65 is a remainder of 1. Very good. Now, I'll reveal the remainders from the 4 column, and I'd like you to tell me what you notice about the remainders in each column. They're in order. They're in the same order as the first column, but in different places. There's one of each from 1 to 7. And 0. These are all good observations. Let's see if they hold for the remaining columns. I want to focus on Ron's observation that in each column, the remainders are unique. That is, there's only one remainder of 6, only one remainder of 3, only one of 0, and so on. Now let's switch temporarily back to the numbers. I happen to know a secret rule that allows me to discard all those remaining numbers that are not relatively primed to 8. And then I once again replace them with their remainders when divided by 8. Do you notice anything? I don't see any 6s. And there's no 2s. And no zeros or 4s either. What about the remainders that you do see? They're 1, 3, 5, and 7. They're all relatively prime to 8. Yes, they are. I was just going to say that. So that's your secret rule. 
you only had to check if the remainder was 0, 2, or 4, or 6. That was exactly my secret rule. I knew that the only numbers relatively prime to 8 are those whose remainders, when divided by 8, are themselves relatively prime to 8. And in fact, there are phi of 8, that is, 4, such numbers in each column. So these numbers are relatively prime to 8, and we already know that they're relatively prime to 9. So they are relatively prime to 8 and 9. They're the numbers we're looking for. So now we have to count how many there are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You don't have to count one at a time. There's the same number of them in each column. Oh yeah, six columns, four in each, that's uh, 24. Am I right? Yes, you are. Looking at the numbers that have not been discarded, there are phi of nine columns, each of which contains phi of eight numbers. And from stage one, we know that these numbers are relatively prime to eight times nine. That is, these are the 24 numbers less than 72 that are relatively prime to 72. Based on our example, let's analyze what's needed to show that this strategy works for any appropriate S and T. In stage two of the proof, we figure out which columns to keep and which to discard. If you remember, we keep the columns where the top number is relatively primed to T. Of course, there are a fee of T of these. In order to discard an entire column, we need to prove that if the top number D is relatively primed to T, then so is every number in the column. Equally, if D is not relatively prime, then neither are the other numbers in the column. Isn't that the same thing? It's like we're proving it twice. Well, if we just show that if D is relatively prime, then the whole column is, we're not ruling out the possibility that one of the other columns could be hiding a number that is also relatively prime. As you work through stage two, look out for the phrase, suppose now. That indicates the start of the second item. So now that phi of t columns have been retained and the rest discarded, we look at the remainders when the numbers are divided by s. Stage three begins by showing what Ron observed earlier, namely that no two of these are the same. This is done by assuming that there are cells in rows m and n that have the same remainder, and then showing that m equals n, that is, that the rows are one and the same. In the final stage, we focus on the remainders when the numbers are divided by s, and show that these remainders tell us which numbers are relatively prime to s. That means having to show that if the remainder is relatively prime, then so is the number. And if the number is relatively prime, then so is the remainder. Like Emmy said, isn't that kind of the same thing? I understand how you could see it that way, but think of it as follows. We could instead prove this equivalent statement. Let A be the set of these numbers that are relatively prime to S, and let B be the set of these numbers whose remainders, when divided by S, are relatively prime to S. How would you prove that A equals B? Um... Do the subset thing? Exactly. You would need a two-stage proof in which you show A is a subset of B, and then that B is a subset of A. In fact, you would be doing a proof very similar to the two-stage proof shown here as stage four. The mathematical proof techniques that we're using are very advanced, and I don't expect you to understand every nuance. That said, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to read the proofs slowly and carefully. There are two important reasons for this. 
First, reading such a proof deepens your understanding of the theory of numbers in a way that simply taking my word for it can't achieve. Second, it's an important part of a process that will one day enable you to write proofs of your own, perhaps about an area of number theory that you yourself discover. So take your time, be patient, and expect to reread sections as necessary, as well as reminding yourself of the theorems, like the reduction and division theorems, that the proof relies on. Oh boy. Hey, I'm going to need a new bag of cookies.